Well, thanks so much for uh, putting our paper on the program. So this is joint work with uh, Stein van Nieuwburg, who's here as well, and Moto Yogo. And in fact, putting this paper in the, on the second day of this conference is, is, is a great idea because, I know, for the second day of skiing, it may be a good moment to think a little bit about health risk and, and mortality risk, which is what this paper is all about. So it's motivated by two questions. So first question is, is a fairly basic question. How do you optimally form your portfolio of health and longevity products? And when I say health and longevity products, I want to think about annuities, life insurance, long-term care insurance, and supplementary health insurance. And as you may know by some experience choosing these products, they come in a wide variety. They have different, different maturities, different payout structures, and it's, it's, it's a very complex problem to how to put all of these products together and how to pick among these products to form your optimal portfolio. And in fact, there's very little like textbook guidance on how to choose your optimal portfolio. So what we want to do in the same way as we've been thinking about equities and fixed income, we want to develop simple risk measures that allow us to choose among these different products, okay, to summarize the characteristics of these products. So for instance, for equities, we have, we have the beta, for fixed income, we have duration, and we're going to introduce what we call the health and the mortality delta for all of these different health and longevity products. So all of these products can be summarized in just these two risk measures. And then the next thing that we show is that the solution to a life cycle problem can be summarized in terms of your optimal consumption policy, your optimal health delta, and your optimal mortality delta. So that means that combining all of these products into a portfolio becomes a very simple task. You simply, you simply compute the health and mortality deltas for these different products, and you form a portfolio in such a way that it matches the optimal health and mortality delta that it comes from the life cycle model. Okay, and this portfolio is not necessarily unique, but it's gonna give you an answer how to achieve the optimal portfolio. The second part of the paper, we're going to take this framework to the data. And we're going to ask the question, to what extent is the observed, the observed portfolio choice of households in terms of insurance products optimal? And we're going to use data from the HRS for this. And it's going to follow a long literature that tries to understand what is the cost of suboptimal savings decisions, what, is the, what are the cost of suboptimal investment decisions, such as the work by John Campbell. We're going to sort of look at, at the insurance part of the portfolio problem here. And of course, there's, there's been a lot of work on, on the question to what extent people annuitize enough or to what extent people buy enough life insurance. But the unique feature of our paper is that we can look at all of these products together. Because all of these different health and longevity products generate a health delta. They generate a mortality delta. And looking at all of these products in isolation is not going to give you the overall exposure that you have to health risk and mortality risk. As an analogy, you want to think about it as as asking the question to what extent people invest enough in equities by only looking at their private savings and forgetting about the fact that they, that they have a 401k plan. Okay, we would all easily agree that, that that wouldn't be the right way to do it. So we want to add all of those insurance products in, in a portfolio and put them at the same footing. So let me dive right into the, to the setup that we have. So a household's gonna live at least for capital, to, capital T periods. We're gonna have three health states. We can, we can easily uh, generalize the framework to more health states, but we need at least three. So health state one is when you're dead. Health state two is when you're in poor health. And health state three is when you're in good health, okay? We have transition probabilities, pi t i j. That's a probability that an agent uh, of age little t that is currently in health state i is gonna transition next period to health state j, okay? And these, these probabilities are age-specific and cohort-specific in our empirical work. On top of that, in each health state at a given age, the household's going to face out-of-pocket health expenditures. Okay? And those are denoted by MTHD. Okay? On top of that, over the life cycle, something that depends on age, the household's going to receive income. Before retirement, it's going to be labor income. After retirement, it's Social Security <laughs> income. And on top of that, we, we allow the household to invest in a variety of these, these health and longevity products. So first of all, the household can invest in life insurance. Secondly, it's annuities. And thirdly, it's health insurance. On top of that, it's going to have a risk-free savings account. It's going to earn a rate of interest R. So life insurance, it's going to give you a payoff of $1,000, say, if you die next period. Annuities will give you a payoff of $1,000 if you, if you make it to the next period, so if you don't die. And the way we define health insurance is as a differential payoff between the expenditures you face if you're in poor health relative to the expenditures you face if you're in good health, okay? So with this menu of assets, clearly the market is completed uh, uh, dynamically. 
So let me now introduce the health and the mortality deltas. And let me illustrate graphically how you can compute them for all of these different products. And so the way we define the health delta is as the differential payoff that these products generate if you're in poor health relative to being in good health. Similarly, the mortality delta is defined as the payoff you get if you die from these products relative to being in good health. So what you see here, the, the left two panels are, are for life insurance, the middle two panels for annuities, and the right two panels for health insurance. So let me walk you through the example. Look at the top left panel. So what you see there are the three health states. Either you're dead, you're in poor health, or you're in good health. The black solid line indicates the payoff. So life insurance is going to give you a payoff of, of 1,000 if you're, if, you're, if you're dead. And it's going to give you zero payoff if it's one period life insurance if you're in poor health or in good health. So what does it mean for the health delta? The health delta, the differential payoff between being in poor health relative to good health, the payoffs are identical, so it has a zero health delta. The mortality delta, the differential payoff between being dead and being in good health, in this case, is $1,000. Okay, so you have a positive mortality delta, zero health delta. Now, instead of being a one-period life insurance contract, if this is a long-term life insurance contract, then the value of this contract, the next period, if you're still alive, is not zero, because you may die in subsequent periods where the contract will pay out. Now, this contract will, will be more valuable if you're closer to being dead. Okay, so if you're in poor health, the contract has a higher value than when you're in good health. So that means that now the health delta is no longer zero. The health delta, the differential payoff of being in poor health relative to good health is now actually positive. So long-term health insurance has a positive health delta, positive mortality delta. Similarly, you can walk through the other examples. So let me do one more. Let's take annuities. So a one-period annuity is going to give you $1,000 if you're in poor health or good health next period, nothing if you die. Same payoff in both health states, so zero health delta. But it's actually transferring resources from being dead to being, to being alive. So that means that you have a negative mortality delta in this case. Exactly the opposite as life insurance. If you have a long-term contract, then the value of being in poor health is lower than, of the annuity than being in good health. Because if you're in good health, your, your life expectancy is longer than when you're in poor health. So that means that the payoff in poor health is now lower than when you're in good health. So that means that you have a negative health delta and also a negative mortality delta, OK? So the main takeaway from this is by thinking about the health and the mortality delta, we can summarize the risk characteristics of all of these products in these two simple risk measures. So the next thing that I want to do is to set up a simple life cycle model and show you that we can not only compute these, these, these health and mortality deltas for all of these products, but we can also express a solution to this life cycle model in terms, of, in terms of the health and the mortality delta of, of wealth, okay? So the main ingredient that we still need to add, because we, we, we talked about the investment technology before, is the objective function of the household. So standard life cycle, uh, like life cycle objective function, so the household derives utility from consumption, gamma is measuring risk aversion, beta the subjective discount factor. The only thing that's, that's a little different here is that we have these omegas floating around. So omega-1 over here is measuring the bequest motive. So it's telling you how much do you value wealth after you die, for instance, because of, of, of uh, your spouse or because of your children. The second thing that's, that's a little different is that we have the omega-2 and the omega-3 here. The omega-2 and the omega-3 measure how much do you value consumption when you're in poor health relative to how much do you value consumption when you're in good health. If omega-2 is smaller than omega-3, then you value consumption more when you're in good health than when you're in poor health. Another way of saying that is that, that health and consumption are, are complements. So you enjoy consumption more when you're in good health. When you go to a nice restaurant, you can actually play golf or you can go to the slopes here. When, it, when you're in poor health, you don't, you, don't, you don't enjoy consumption as much. Okay, so we allow for that added flexibility to have, have state-dependent utility. And this optimization is going to be subject to the standard budget constraints. So <clears throat> we have three, three main propositions in the paper. So the first proposition is simply telling you that you can express a solution to this life cycle model in terms of your optimal consumption policy, your optimal health delta, and your optimal mortality delta at the level of wealth now. 
So define total wealth as, as net worth plus the present value of all future labor income minus the present value of all future medical expenditures. Then <clears throat> we, we derive an expression for the propensity to consume, which is proportional to, to total wealth. And we define your health delta and the mortality delta. Now, the health delta is going to be the, the wealth you want to have if you're in poor health relative to good health. And the mortality delta is the wealth you want to have if you die relative to being in, in good health. So let me try to generate some expressions for the optimal health and mortality deltas that come from, from this problem. So the optimal health delta, delta is this expression on top, which looks a little ugly at first, but it has a lot of intuition to it. So the optimal health delta, so how much more wealth do you want to bring to the poor health state relative to the good health state, depends on three main things. First, the omega poor relative to the omega good. So if I care more about, about consumption when I'm in poor health, my health delta is going to be higher. Okay? Secondly, if my propensity to consume is lower when I'm in poor health, okay, when out of total wealth I want to consume less aggressively, I want to transfer more wealth to the poor health state relative to the good health state. So my health delta is going to be higher. Thirdly, there's a cash flow effect. If the expected expenditures when I get to poor health are a lot higher than my expenditures when I'm in good health, I also want to transfer more wealth to the poor health state. So those are the three main drivers of having a high health delta in, in your life cycle model. And there's a similar intuition to the optimal mortality delta. Okay? So this is the way you can express the, the solution to the life cycle model. Now the next proposition is telling you simply that if you compute the health and the mortality deltas for all of these different products, so here we have life insurance, annuities, and health insurance, and they come in a variety of maturities, indexed by n. If I compute the health and the mortality delta for all of those products, then I can form a portfolio with these BITNs, which is the dollar amount I invest in each of these products, in such a way that I exactly match the optimal health and the mortality delta that follow from my life cycle model. Now, of course, if you give me many, many products, this solution is not necessarily unique. Okay? But it does show you that these health and mortality deltas are sufficient statistics to summarize the risks that are in these products and the solution of your life cycle model. Okay, so this is telling you exactly how to form your optimal portfolio of health and, and long, uh, longevity products. Now the last thing that we want to do is we want to be able to say something about how costly it is to deviate from these optimal policies. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to compare an alternative set of deltas denoted with the deltas without the stars. We want to compare them to the optimal ones and see how costly they are. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to consider a second order perturbation of, of the value function around the optimal policies. The first order perturbation by the envelope condition is going to be equal to zero, so we need to do a second order perturbation. So we're going to measure the deviations from these deltas, from the delta stars, the optimal ones, and then you get these second order terms that measure how costly it is in utility terms. And it's going to tell us what fraction of total wealth are you willing to give up to move from your suboptimal portfolio to the optimal portfolio? And the nice thing of this expansion is that you can actually break it down into the different pieces. So the first part here is measuring pretty much the deviation that you have from having a suboptimal health delta. The second component here is measuring the cost of having a suboptimal mortality delta. And then there's this cross term, but in empirically that cross term turns out to be very small. So later on, when I take this to the data, we can actually break up the total cost in the cost coming from suboptimal health delta choices and suboptimal mortality delta choices. OK, okay so let me, uh, let me take this uh, to the data now. So we're going to use the HRS data uh, that starts in 1992. We have uh, respondents that are older, 51 and older, and they're sampled every, every two years. We're going to focus on the subsample of males to generate some homogeneity in our, in our sample. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to define health states. Because before we had dead, we had poor health and good health. Well, dead is pretty unambiguous. The only thing that's ambiguous is how we define poor health and how we define good health. So the way we do this is that we first estimate a probit model. And we estimate the probability that you die the next period, depending on a whole host of characteristics summarizing your current health status that is observable. Okay, then we're going to compute the probability that you die for each household and we're going to define 
the health state of the individual as being in poor health if the probability of dying is higher than the median. And on top of that, if the health expenditures that you face this period are higher than the median as well. So the way we want to think about poor health is as a state in which it is more likely that you die. And on top of that, where you face high health expenditures. Okay, that's how we want to summarize the poor health state. Then everyone who is not in poor health state but still alive, we're going to call that that agent is in, is in good health. Okay? So what are the key inputs otherwise for, for bringing our model to the data? We estimate the, uh, the health transition probabilities for moving from one state to the other, accounting for cohort effects and, and age effects, out-of-pocket health expenditures, um, again, controlling for, for uh, cohort and, and age effects. We have income that includes Social Security, but any pension income or annuities, we will exclude. Okay, we count that as, as the choice that the household has. And we're going to assume initially that the, the, uh, the health and the longevity products are priced in an actuarially fair way. Okay, you may argue that there's, there's loads and all these kind of things out there, so we're also going to have a robustness check later on when we introduce those loads and we calculate how the results, results change. I mean, aren't you worried about the, 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 the employee health expenses of the variable? Let's talk about that later, if that's fine with you. Okay, so we can, we can change like how we do the accounting here and see how sensitive it, it is to that. Okay, so any premiums that you pay, okay, as part of your insurance, we count that as out-of-pocket expenditures. Okay, so it's not that you, it's not a kind of like that, that, you're, that it's gifted, right? So you do, you do count it there. <coughs> okay, so what we observe for each household are the term and whole life, uh, life insurance positions. We observe the annuities, including private pensions. We observe supplementary health insurance and we observe long-term care insurance. Okay, so we map all of these to our model, which allows us to, to compute the observed health and mortality delta in the data for each household in the HRS. Okay, and let me first summarize what these positions look like on average and then compute the health and the mortality deltas in the data. So what you see here is the fraction of households that own term life insurance, whole life insurance, annuities including private, private pensions, supplementary health insurance, and long-term care insurance. Okay, so what you see is that there's a large fraction of households that have some form of life insurance. It's definitely declining over, uh, over by, by age, but still the initial fraction is, is, is fairly high. And, and even at later ages, you see that even at age 75, still 50% of households has, has some sort of life insurance. Annuities are also fairly high, but, but, but remember that we include defined benefit pension plans in there. Okay? You see that these, these health insurance policies are fairly low, and there's been a lot of debate to what extent these pickup rates are too low. And in that sense, in, 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 in some sense, that's kind of the main point of our paper. There's separate, almost like separate literatures about each of these graphs, asking the question to what extent the choices people make in terms of annuities are optimal, or to what extent choices people make in terms of life insurance are optimal. What we argue is that all of these different products generate some exposure to health risk and some exposure to mortality risk. So if you want to make a statement to what extent deviations from optimal insurance exposures are, are costly, you want to be able to aggregate all of those products. Okay? And, and, and we provide a framework to, to do that. So let's look at the health and the mortality deltas in the data then. On the horizontal axis, you see, you see H. Left panel is the health delta. The right panel is the, is the mortality delta. Each dot in this figure corresponds to a respondent in the HRS. Okay? There's three main observations here. First of all, you see there's a lot of dispersion. Okay, so there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of health deltas and mortality deltas. And secondly, there's more, more heterogeneity in terms of mortality delta than there is in health deltas. Okay? Thirdly, if you look at the means and the medians, so the medians are the black solid lines, the means are the, are the dashed lines, you see that the mortality delta is initially positive. Well, how do you generate this? Remember that life insurance had a positive mortality delta. So houses around age 50, 60 have substantial life insurance positions that's generating this positive mortality delta. Then as they get older, they gradually shift to annuities. Okay, remember annuities have a negative mortality delta, and that's why the mortality delta goes negative here, and then it, it gradually goes to zero if you, if you get closer to, to the end of the period. Okay? Now, one of the questions we want to ask is, to what extent can we explain the heterogeneity in the health and the mortality deltas 
with things that are in our model or things that may, we may be missing in our model. So what we do here, it's a little small maybe to see, but let me summarize it. What we do here is regress the health and the mortality delta on characteristics that we either have in our model or don't have in our model. Okay? So the, the first two columns are regressions of the health delta. The next two columns are the regressions of the mortality delta on characteristics. Columns one and three regress the health and the mortality delta on characteristics that are part of our model, such as age and health. The first thing you observe is, if you look at the R-squared values, they're 7% and 12% only. So there's only a very small fraction of the heterogeneity in health and mortality deltas that we can explain with, with characteristics that are part of our model. So one may argue is, well, you want to extend your model and account for the fact that, that there's heterogeneity in bequests coming from people having children, people being married, and things like that. If you add all of these things, you see the R squared increase a little bit, but not that much. The R squared values are still like 13% and 16%. So what it means is that even if you were to generalize your model and, and introduce children, introduce like couples and things like that, and exactly hit all the variation that is associated with, with those characteristics, then still there's a lot of variation that's unexplained. So one of the main puzzling facts here is that there seems to be so much heterogeneity in these health and mortality deltas, even though most of the literature, for instance, the annuities literature, has been focusing on the level, why people don't annuitize more. Okay, we argue that there's actually a lot of annuitization going on, but there's just a lot of heterogeneity. Now the next obvious question is to ask, well, is it really that costly to deviate from your optimal policy? Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe these deviations appear to be large, but are not, uh, are not that costly in utility terms. So in order to do that, we need to pin down the preference parameters. So what we're going to do is we're going to set risk aversion to 4, which is this standard magical number that people use in HRS studies. Um, it's not going to be incredibly sensitive to that number. We, we, we know we do robustness with respect to that parameter as well. The parameters omega 1 and omega 2, so this is the bequest motive. This is the utility you derive if you're in poor health. Those we estimate by minimizing the loss over all the households. So the way to think about this is that this may not uncover the true preference parameters of the households, but it gives them the best shot to generate the lowest welfare cost of deviating from the optimal policy. Okay? So we estimate those parameters with, with GMM, and what you see is that there's a fairly strong bequest motive. So this omega 1 equal to 5 means that it's about 10 periods of consumption that you have on average as bequest. The omega 2 is slightly smaller than the omega 3. Okay? And that is pointing to this complementarity between health and consumption. People care less about consumption when they're in poor health relative to being in, in good health. So here we, we compute the welfare costs using these preference parameters for all these different households. The top panels give you the, to, the, the per period cost. What that means is that you make a mistake one period, and after that one period you implement the optimal policy. The bottom panels integrate it over the entire life cycle and add up those costs if you make them each and every period, okay, which is a more likely scenario. The left panel, the green dots, give the total lifetime cost. And what you see is that starting at age 51, these costs are really high. Someone between age 50 and 60, following the optimal policies in, or following the policies that we measure in the HRS, is willing to give up about 30% of, of total wealth in order to move to the optimal policies. If you break it down in terms of the health, health delta and the mortality delta, we see that most of the costs are generated by the mortality delta, which was suggested earlier already given the fact there was so much so much heterogeneity there. Now we do a bunch of robustness checks and extensions to see whether this, this is results, uh, robust. So we allow for non-actuarial pricing. We play around with preference parameters. And in work in progress, we're even allowing for, for unobserved heterogeneity in all of these preference parameters. But we find that these welfare costs are not really much lowered by, by, by extending them all in all of these different ways. So, the main, main conclusion up to this point is that there's three ways to think about our results. So if you, if you think our model is reasonable, and again, this model is used in, in many different applications, then these welfare costs seem to be quite substantial. The second possibility is that you believe there's some misspecification in, in our model, and we will have to think about like, how to reformulate the model, but that also has implications for, for lots of other applications. And thirdly, another way of thinking about it is that markets are actually not as complete as, as we're assuming. However, the way I started is that there is this wide variety in terms of payout structures and this wide variety of maturities. 
So arguing that these markets are incomplete and that you can't ensure certain states um, may not be the most convincing argument. On top of that, we're working now on new results where we actually show that most of the variation in the mortality delta is generated by the type of pension plan you have. So households with defined benefit pension plans, they're endowed with a lot of annuities. They get it from their pension plans and they don't offset it by buying life insurance. People with defined contribution plans don't, don't buy annuities. So what that means is, is that you need to argue that, that households start to work, so households without a bequest motive start to work for employers with defined benefit pension plans and households with a bequest motive start to work for companies with, uh, uh, with a defined contribution pension plan, which to us seems a bit of a stretch. So if you're not willing to go down that path, then it seems to be the case that, that these, these mistakes may be fairly costly. So the last thing we do in the last three minutes is just to show what the optimal policies look like in terms of, uh, in terms of the standard products that you know. So we just pick a cohort, 1936 to 1940, uh, a male age 51, starting off in good health with $66,000. Um, <clears> we filter the guy through our life cycle model, and what you see here are the optimal health delta and mortality delta. Those are the black solid lines. Horizontal axis again, H. <clears throat> the blue, the green, and the red line tells you how to implement the optimal policy. And let me just focus on the health delta. So you see the optimal health delta is first slightly negative and then it swings up. Why is that the case? Well, if you're, remember that the, the preference parameters indicate that you care less about consumption in poor health relative to good health. So that's dominating in this region. And that's why you want to have less wealth if you're in, in, in poor health relative to being in good health. But later in life, the, the cost uh, of being sick are, are a lot higher, so the present value of future costs are high, and that's why the health delta swings up here. How do you implement this? Well, we know that, that long-term annuities have a negative health delta, so you buy some long-term annuities to generate the swing down, and then here, the, at, at a later age, you start to buy health insurance to generate this upswing in your optimal health delta. Okay, so this is a way to implement the optimal solution with only long positions in very standard products that are, that are available. So summarizing, what we try to do here is to, to compute or introduce risk measures for these health and longevity sensitive products. And we hope that it will, that it will allow us to, to compare all of these different products, to standardize them, to identify the overlap between these different products, and hopefully also identify the risks that, that may not be covered by the products that are out there, that may then spur product innovation. We, um, we show that if you, if you take this to the data, that the potential welfare gains of either household mistakes or missing markets are very large, okay? So they amount to about 27% of wealth for a household between age 50 and 60. And an alternative way, of course, would be that there's some preference heterogeneity that's unobserved with or unrelated to anything that we typically think of should reflect those preference parameters, apart from the type of pension plan that your employer offers, which we think is a bit of a stretch, so in that way, we want to sort of interpret our results. Thank you.